Have you ever stopped to think, just for a moment, about how completely, wonderfully, ridiculously unlikely the rule of law actually is? We live in a society of millions of people. Millions of cars, billions of dollars, trillions of decisions and opinions and connections, and it works. People drive on the left. They pretty much don't speed. They don't usually drink and drive. If the police turn on their lights and sirens, people get out of the way. We can generally walk down the street without getting robbed by people bigger and tougher than us. When we go to work... Our bosses pay what they're supposed to. If we buy something, we expect it to work or else we take it back. When the time comes to vote, we all get our say. It doesn't matter who we are, or whereabouts we live, or how rich we are, or how strong we are. We are all bound by the same rules, the same laws. We're so used to those laws that we often don't even stop to think about them. They're just there. They just work. And if they don't work, well, we have police to investigate, courts to try disputes, parliaments to change the law. All of which happens in the background, while most people simply get on with life. The rule of law is perhaps the most remarkable institution that ever existed. It brings a level of peace and prosperity and security that we simply couldn't obtain in any other way. And now you're here to learn some of its secrets, to learn about the law, why it is the way it is, how it manages to hold our society together, what it all means. What an exciting beginning. I'm so glad I can share it with you. G'day, everyone. My name is Anthony Maranak and I'm a lecturer in law at CQ University Australia. I'm a barrister at the Queensland Bar and I've previously worked for the Australian Parliament in the Department of the Senate. I've worked as counsel assisting in Queensland's Office of the State Coroner and I've served as a legal officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. This is the first video in the first module of our Introduction to Law. This introductory course is designed to give you both knowledge and skills, but the focus is definitely on the skills. The idea is that by the end of all five modules, you will establish a good, sound basis of legal knowledge, but more importantly, that you will develop the skills which are necessary to send you on your way as a successful law student and one day a successful lawyer. The first module is called Fundamentals of Law, and in this first video, we start by thinking about the rule of law and the legal profession. We ask, what are these? What do they mean? What do lawyers do? What are their skills? What will you, as the end product, look like after all this study is done? Australia, like most other advanced nations in the world, lives under the rule of law. Well, what does that mean exactly? I mean, we've all heard the phrase, right? The rule of law. But what exactly does that mean? Well, I want you to start by thinking about a netball team. Any team will do. If you think about it, there's a range of ways in which the team might organise themselves. First, they might organise themselves by the rule of chance. In this situation, there are no rules. Everything that happens is random. Everything that everyone does is random. There's no coordination. They don't even need to agree on what shape the ball should be or where it should go or whether there should be a ball at all. It's a glorious, glorious anarchy. And sometimes we all need a little anarchy. But it doesn't win any netball games, right? So then they might try the rule of superstition. They might tell one another tales and come to realise that when the sun is out, the ball must be thrown, but when the sun's behind a cloud, the ball must be kicked. Because if you don't follow those rules, bad things are going to happen. Now, this is better than anarchy, even if only slightly. But it's still not going to win too many games, right? What's another option? 
How about the rule of might or the rule of terror? The biggest, baddest, nastiest person makes the rules. And if you don't obey, then they'll hurt you. Doesn't even have to be one person. You might have an in crowd who control all the resources or the power or the weapons. And they can make rules and force everyone else to follow. Well, what do we think of this? I mean, it's still a step up from randomness or superstition or anarchy. At least somebody's in charge now, right? The team will be playing much better than it was. The difficulty is, of course, that it's really only doing that for the benefit of the people who control the fear. That's not really so healthy. If you could leave that team, you would for sure. So maybe what we need is the rule of authority. Let's have one person or maybe a couple of people who are the team captain. And we will all agree to obey all their decisions no matter what. They decide the positions and the strategies and everyone else just obeys them. Now this can actually work and work really well. But only, only if the person who is in charge wields their authority with care. If they start to make stupid decisions or play favourites, then people will start to disobey them. And what happens then? We go straight back to the rule of might, really, don't we? Because a leader who is being disobeyed, well, they'll either force everyone to obey or they won't be the leader much longer. There is a better way. What if there were rules that bound everyone, including the leaders? And what if there were rules about how those leaders were appointed and how they could be dismissed? What if there were even rules about how the rules get made? In that case, you could appoint or elect a leader without making them completely in charge. They'd have to follow the rules too. And if they didn't, well then they could be removed no matter how big and tough they were. Now, of course, this does not just work for netball. You see, human beings started out millennia ago in a state of anarchy. And many societies developed mythologies which usually included rules based on superstition. I mean, in 1456, Pope Calixtus III excommunicated Halley's Comet, believing that the comet was a portent of evil. This seems quite insane to us now, but under a system of rule by superstition, well, such a decision made sense. Eventually, superstition gave way to rule by force in the form of the warrior kings. That's how you became king by being the biggest, toughest fighter and gathering the biggest, toughest army. And if somebody else's army beat yours, well, then you were probably killed. But you were certainly displaced from power. We've also seen what rule by individual powerful people looks like. Kings who claimed to rule by divine right, that is, with the blessing of God. Dictators who claim that their destiny is to lead their people. Ruling yuntas who attack whole populations. Interesting, isn't it? How rule by people and rule by force so often overlap. Instead, ideally, we have the rule of law. Literally everyone from the queen down to a newborn baby, is subject to the rule of law. Politicians are bound by the law. Judges are bound by the law. An Australian Prime Minister by the name of Bob Hawke was once interviewed on TV in the back of a car. He wasn't wearing his seatbelt. And people watching the TV noticed this and called in. And the Prime Minister had to pay a fine. 
See, not even the Prime Minister is above the law. The law can be changed, of course, but there are rules about that too. That's what we mean when we talk about the rule of law. Nobody, no politician, no king or queen, no god or priest, no fighter or lover is above the law. It binds us all and it protects us all. Now that doesn't mean we all experience the law in the same way. Indigenous people, women, gay people, people with disabilities, people of different ages, people in different social classes, people with different incomes, they all experience the law in different ways. But ultimately, they are all subject to the law. It's so very important that this should be the very first thing you learn about the law. Because this one thought, that we live under the rule of law, will underpin all of your studies of the law. Now, as you'll find out in the next video, much of Australia's legal heritage was imported from the United Kingdom back when Australia was a set of British colonies. The shape of our legal profession is therefore very British. So when we talk about the profession of law, what do we mean? Well, the first thing is that we are talking about a profession. You, as students of law, are entering the profession of law. You are becoming a part of something bigger than yourself, taking on a duty to a higher calling. You see, the rule of law can't operate without people. People who work in the law and who are, of course, subject to the law. So who are some of the people that we meet in the profession of law? Well, let's start with judges. We meet them under a number of different names. Judges, magistrates, justices, tribunal members, coroners. Their role is to hear a case impartially, to hear the arguments raised by either side and to give the very best decision they can in accordance with the law. They have to do this even if they personally disagree with the laws they are administering. They have to do this despite any personal sympathy they might feel for the parties to the dispute. They have to do this even if they know the public reaction will be angry towards them. In front of those judges in the court we find barristers and next to them solicitors. Solicitors make up the bulk of the legal profession and do the vast majority of the heavy lifting. They advise clients on a thousand different matters, from how to set up a business partnership, to how to write a will, to what are reasonable parenting arrangements after a separation, to what sentence a person is likely to get for a criminal offence. If the dispute requires parties to go to court, well, that's where barristers come in. Barristers are courtroom specialists trained to argue matters on their feet in the courtroom. Now, barristers and solicitors, just like judges, are subject to the law. Once they take a client on, they give their best advice to assist that client as much as they can within the law. They do this no matter what their personal beliefs might be, no matter what the public reaction might be. They won't lie to the court. And they won't break the law, but they will help their clients as much as they lawfully can, without fear or favour. A somewhat newer branch of the profession practices alternative dispute resolution. This takes many forms, from negotiation, to mediation, to arbitration, to facilitation. It's all about keeping matters away from court and assisting parties to resolve disputes between themselves. Now, you might notice a pattern here. Alternative dispute resolution practitioners also assist parties regardless of their own personal opinions, and often regardless of their own ideas about how the matter ought to be resolved. They are there to assist the parties 
without fear, without favour. There are others, of course, police officers, parliamentarians, court staff, parliamentary staff, all working under the rule of law, all working within the law, all bound by the law in pursuit of justice. Well, all that sounds pretty high and mighty, doesn't it? Uh, let's bring it down a level or two. When we think about lawyers and the law, in really general terms, what do lawyers actually do? What is their role? This is an important question to ask at the start because many people are really quite fascinated with lawyers because they've seen Rake or Suits or Rumpole of the Bailey, Erin Brockovich or Legally Blonde for that matter, and it looks exciting and fashionable and they really want to be part of that. And I've got to say, Sometimes this profession really does offer moments of extraordinary excitement. There really is something terribly exciting about watching a jury come back in at the end of a case, waiting in that suspenseful moment to find out who wins and who loses. But we're all grown-ups. We all understand that the TV and movies present a stylized, idealized version of legal practice. So let's think more realistically about lawyers. I would suggest to you that lawyers have two roles. First, they're problem solvers or problem preventers. Second, lawyers are dispute resolvers. Let's start with the idea of problems. I've got to tell you, not too many people show up at the lawyer's office because things are going well. Usually they are there because there's a problem or because they think there might be a problem. Look, I've just broken up with my boyfriend and he's taking it really hard. He sent me a message a couple of days ago basically saying that if I didn't give him another chance then he would post some pictures of me online. Some private pictures, you know what I mean? What can I do about it? Well, in the immediate sense, there are a couple of things we can do. Just to clarify, the pictures themselves if they are posted and they're of an obscene or personal nature, in the, in the, in the sense that you've described here, he has committed an offence. What we can do right now is write a letter to see if we can warn him off and make him aware of the legal consequences of actually doing it. Thank you, that sounds really awesome. I've, I've been thinking about my will. I've got two boys of my own and my current partner has a daughter. Now, one thing that I'm worried about is that my ex is going to try and do something to keep all the money for herself or just for my two boys. How can I stop that from happening? So we can draft the will in, in a way that shows you've carefully thought out whether to give her anything or not and that you've decided obviously not to. Do you have a copy of the will with you? Can you see how each of these clients has walked in with a problem and each of them has walked out with a solution? Now, in those two cases, the problems were quite simple and most solicitors would be able to handle those issues off the cuff without any preparation. Often, though, clients come in with more complex problems. A lawyer might not be able to give an answer on the spot. It might take considerable research or they might even need to go to a specialist for an opinion. In each case, though, the lawyer is working to try to resolve the problem that walked through the door. You might also notice that in those cases, there really wasn't a dispute as such. The first client has received threats, but they haven't been delivered on. The second client isn't dead yet, so his will is only a matter of speculation. Often, though, clients come to lawyers when there is a dispute. At this point, the lawyer's role as dispute resolvers kicks in. On a good day, dispute resolution might be as simple as picking up the phone. Hi Marie, I'm calling about the Jones matter. Your client didn't send young Nicole to spend time with my client these holidays. My client's obviously very distressed and we need to sort something out to make up that time and to try and make sure this doesn't happen again. Eric, look, I know your client is distressed, but after the last trip, Nicola came home and said that your client had been drunk every evening she was there and that she was bored and upset. 
If a phone call doesn't work, lawyers can assist clients to explore alternative dispute resolution options, such as mediation. Okay, the idea of this mediation is for me to assist the two of you, as Nicola's parents, to reach an outcome that you're comfortable with, and an outcome that's in Nicola's interests. Now, I know you both have your solicitors with you today, and I'm sure that they'll be able to assist you through this process. Ultimately, of course, dispute resolution may require a matter to be heard in court. This might then involve barristers, and it will certainly involve judges. Can you see how once there is a dispute underway, the lawyer's role is to represent their client to the best of their ability to reach an outcome that their client can live with? So right the way through this introduction to law courts, and right the way through your law degree, every time you come across a lawyer, think to yourself, what problem are they solving? What problem are they preventing? What dispute are they resolving? Because once you cut away all the details, those three things are really what lawyers do. Okay, so now we know what lawyers do. What skills do they have? And what skills do you need in order to do those things? If you want to become a good lawyer, what skills do you need to develop? Well, first and foremost, it's always going to be the case that the law is made of words, millions of them. Books and statutes and journals and law reports and websites, all brimming with words. When legal disputes occur, they start out with letters and statements of claim and continue on with indictments and defences and contracts and wills and statements and affidavits, all of which are made of words. If you want to be a lawyer, there's simply no way around the fact that much of your life will be spent reading and writing. Like it or hate it, you must become an expert user of language. If your writing skills are limited or if your reading comprehension is limited, then you will have to work a lot harder to study the law successfully. If, however, you write compulsively and devour books as soon as you can get your hands on them, well then you'll be right at home. There are no shortcuts in the law. Careful, detailed reading and precise, balanced writing are absolutely crucial. Those are not the only skills you will need though. The next skill you're going to need is the skill of analysis. Analysis is about looking under the surface of a dispute or a proposition to read between the lines and ask questions like, why and how? I'm an Indigenous person, and when that police officer interviewed me, they were supposed to make sure that I had a support person. They didn't do that, and now I think that interview is going to be used against me. Well, the officer doesn't have to allow a support person if the officer considers that you're not under a disadvantage compared to any other member of the community. Though I guess what we do need to do is think of a few things. First, we need to be sure the officer actually knew you were Indigenous. Indigenous, And we, second, what we would need to look for are clues to tell us whether the officer really didn't believe you were under a disadvantage or whether they were intentionally just ignoring the rules so they could give you a hard time. See how the lawyer has broken down the issue, thought about the relevant law and the different possible explanations? Now the lawyers try to work out which of those explanations are valid. That's analysis. It's a key legal skill, but it takes practice. Now let's think about the skill of advocacy, persuasiveness. Have you noticed how on the internet, when the keyboard warriors are firing, everyone comes online and gives their opinion, but nobody ever really changes their views. It's more of an opinion fest. Well, that's not gonna work in the law. When you as a lawyer are making arguments, you're not just doing it out of interest or to make your views known. You're trying to persuade the other side to change their opinion or you're trying to persuade a judge that you're on the correct side of the case. How do you do this? Well, everyone has a slightly different style. Logic, emotion, charm, but above all, an absolute mastery of the details of the case. 
and a professional knowledge of the law that underpins it. Look, your client has pretty clearly dismissed my client unfairly. He was a good worker and he followed all the procedures, rules and regulations that your client put forward. And the accusation that he was lifting money from the till is simply untrue and he knows it. Uh, you know that if we have to go to the Fair Work Commission over this, we're going to do it and we will win. There's got to be a better way to sort this out. Okay, come on, let's be honest. Your bloke was the only guy there when the money went missing. And not only that, his work standards haven't been where they should be. Um, and the money, missing money is just the last straw. Does your client really want to invest money into go, doing a fair work application when he knows he doesn't have good grounds? Oh, he's pretty sure of his ground and so am I as his lawyer. But I could ask you the same thing regarding your client. We don't want to put your client to the costs, do we? So, if we're going to save our client's money, what do you want? Well, my client can see that returning to work isn't a realistic option. There seems to be no option of the uh, employment relationship continuing. Obviously. But he wants a good reference and he wants three months' pay as he is entitled. I don't think I'll get my client to give him a reference letter. I mean, this guy did steal from him. But three months is very ambitious. Again, allegation of theft, no evidence. But if we can go back to our respective clients with an offer, I'm suggesting no reference but eight weeks pay. Hmm, maybe. Let's go talk to the clients then. Now, it's pretty clear that in, even though both lawyers in this discussion started out confidently, neither of them were that confident. They both had weaknesses to overcome, but they also both had a point to make. They made their points pretty well, I thought. And without actually saying so, they acknowledged the strengths of the other side's arguments. You can see that it's pretty likely that both sides will agree to the deal on offer. The dispute will be resolved and the courts won't be troubled. There's one more skill set I want to talk about though, and those are what we call soft skills. As I said earlier, nobody comes to a lawyer when things are going great. People come to see a lawyer when something has gone wrong. They're in distress. And that distress can take on a remarkable variety of forms. Maybe their mum has just died and they're the executor of the will. Maybe their husband has just left them for their best friend and taken the kids with him. Maybe they've just been sacked after reporting unendurable sexual harassment at work. Maybe their business that they worked years to develop looks like going under because they made a contract with an unscrupulous supplier who's just declared bankruptcy. Maybe they've committed a criminal offence and you have to tell them that even with your best efforts, it's likely that they will be going to jail. Maybe their distress reaches you. Maybe they disgust you. But at the end of the day, you have a person in your office and a duty to that person. Your duty is not to make it all better. Your duty is not to be their counsellor. Your duty is to provide them with legal advice. But at some level, this must involve an empathy for their circumstances. If they feel like you have listened, if they feel respected, and if they feel like you are doing your best, then you will have helped. Forget about that traditional notion of hard-nosed, unfeeling lawyers. Maybe a few people in the corporate world get to do that. But for the rest of us, lawyering is a very human business. You'll be exposed to the frailties and flaws of human beings, as well as sometimes to their inspirational strength. The law might be made of words, but it's about people. So now we come to the end of this first video. I hope this has whetted your appetite for all the learning to come. In this video, we've talked about the rule of law and the fact that in a rule of law system, everybody is subject to the law. We're not ruled by people or chance or superstition or by force. We're ruled by laws.
We've also talked about some of the different people in the legal profession, the judges, the solicitors, the barristers, the alternative dispute resolution practitioners. And we've talked about the fact that all of those professionals are involved in the process of problem solving, problem preventing and dispute resolution. Doing those things well involves a range of skills, expert use of language, expertise in research and analysis, the ability to speak and write persuasively, and the ability to use soft skills to deal effectively and respectfully with people in distress. In the next video, we're going to look at legal history. Now, some of you might be tempted to skip that video. History, right? Not interested in history. Tell me about the law now. Trust me, you don't want to skip the next video. You simply can't understand the law unless you understand its history. You'll always be struggling for as long as you study law. It'll always be harder to get it unless you have a sense of the history behind it. So give it a look. I'll see you there.